So my story, you know, I'll try and tell it as best I can in the little time that I have, but in, in essence, it's very simple. By the age of 36 years old, I had achieved the American dream. I had done everything I was supposed to do. I went to medical school, was graduated number one in my class. I had a nice family, a wife, children, picket fence, dog, everything that you would want. Everything that the world said would make you happy and fulfilled inside. The trouble was that once I was there and had achieved it, that was not the case. I was not fulfilled. I wasn't happy. I felt like something was missing. I felt like I hadn't achieved enough. I felt like something wasn't just right, and there was always this sense if I just did this or achieved that or bought this or went there or had this experience, that that would fill it. But the problem was every time I did that, it never worked. Something was drastically wrong. What am I going to do? Who am I going to tell that I'm not happy when I have this? I can't tell anyone. And so what did I do? I tried to fill the void with hobbies, with entertainment, possessions, people, parties, drinking, alcohol, you name it, I tried it. And I tried to feed that emptiness, and I tried to also distract myself from it. If I kept myself busy enough and enough hobbies and enough uh, engagements in life, then I wouldn't have time to think about what was gnawing at me. I also really wasn't the person that I needed to be, and I knew that. That kind of internal frustration leads to being short-tempered, angry, bitter, not treating people, your family, as you should. I basically had three problems. Number one, I had no peace, but I had emptiness, and I just described that to you. No peace, but emptiness, and that emptiness is something that will gnaw at you and lead you to do lots of things to try and distract yourself from it. Number two, I had no hope because we all die, don't we? And the truth is we're all dying. Now, our society has done a good job of hiding from death, not talking about it. It doesn't happen very often. Oh, they passed away. But when you have a family and you have kids and you tuck them in bed at night, knowing that they could die at any moment in a car accident or anything, if you don't have a certainty or knowledge of what happens to them, that's pretty frightening. That, that no hope turns into despair. Because the truth of evolution, the truth of what the world teaches you is dead is dead, gone is gone. And all those memories, all those relationships that you build basically just cease to exist. But there's something inside of you that knows that that's not true. There's something in the human heart that knows that that isn't right, even that death isn't right. Think about it. Why do we die if we are so highly evolved and over millions of years to be these great intelligent beings? Why would everything then just end in death and meaninglessness? Does that really make sense? It didn't to me, but I didn't have an answer, and so I was very frustrated. I realized that true love demands eternity now. You need a certainty of eternity now for those relationships to have meaning, for you to have any kind of peace or hope, but I didn't have a chance of that. What did I do? I you know, tried to capture time by taking videos and photo albums. The only thing is those things backfire on you. Go page through a photo album and look how fast time goes and it will have the opposite effect. You'll be more upset realizing where did the time go. <laughs> Number three, my third problem was I didn't have any power to change. Those two problems combined to create a person that really wasn't all that great, quite honestly. And my wife's here, she could tell you it was probably a lot worse than that. Major problems, but I didn't have any power to change. I wanted to change. I was very frustrated. Because at this point, life is not only not fulfilling in what I thought it would be, at the end, if what I was taught is true, it's meaningless. Now listen, it could not be God, because in the society that I grew up in, number one, I didn't hear anything about him, or very little external things. So if there was really this great hope and great certainty and an answer for this problem, surely I would have heard about it, right? But I did not, or barely. Number two, evolution basically says that if God is, is in the equation, he's very distant. And what kind of God creates a world where everything just decays into death and dying and people are getting murdered and everything else? So it couldn't be him because of that. People weren't talking about him. You go to medical school and you study the human body and you would think if there's any chance that there's a God or a creator or even something as nonspecific as intelligent design that someone would say, gosh, look at that, look how 
intricate the body is, surely, you know, there's a God that created it, but you hear nothing, nothing at all, and silence is not neutrality. When you hear nothing, it is not neutral. It is a strong witness on your heart and shaping your worldview that God is either not knowable or doesn't exist or isn't interested in us. And then there's the problem with all the world religions. There's a lot of them. There's a lot of people believing things other than what Christianity says, and they're all contradictory. They don't fit together like people say they do. I took a religion class in college and study them all. But if so many people are believing different things, how could there be one single answer? And then you have, if Christianity is true, church history riddled with all kinds of problems, murders and wars and religious names and all kinds of problems, right? And so that obviously couldn't be true. And so this is a lonely place to be. This is a place where you're really internally empty and you're not sharing it with everyone because it's embarrassing. So here we are here in the picture at age 36. And realize I had grown up in the absence of God, never went to church, was a rebellious teenager involved in all kinds of things I shouldn't be doing. We won't go into those. Now I'm going to divulge here for one second because when I was that teenager, probably about 16, the Lord, God, bought me this Bible. I didn't know it, but he bought me that when I was 16, and I'll come back to that. Just remember that. So we move into this house. This is going to be it, the big house, the fancy car, what you've always waited for, all the rooms you want, all the furniture you want. Everything is going to be great. And, of course, it didn't fulfill like it like I thought it would. Now, the interesting thing was is that we moved into a street that had lots of Christians on it. The whole street, in fact. <laughs> now, they weren't like the other neighbors in our old neighborhood. We went out and we would grow out in the streets and, and, and had you know, drinking parties and, we would, and everyone was you know, friendly and, and engaging. But here, they were shutting us off. We'd walk down the street. They wouldn't talk to us. No one came to the house to welcome us to the neighborhood. And one day when our kids were out playing, my kids came home crying, and they said, Dad, we're really upset. You know, we're not allowed to play with their kids because we're not Christians. Their mother had called them in, get away from those kids. Now, they're, they're that old. I mean, come on, really? So I was angry. And I told my wife, I said, that's it. I'm sick of this. And I had other dealings with these people. And I said, I'm going to the Christian bookstore. I'm going to buy a Bible. And I'm going to prove that they are wrong, that they are not doing what they should be doing. I had no interest in God. I certainly didn't want to be like them, for sure. And I had this idea, you know, if I became a Christian or something anyway, I'd have this holly hobby life, for those of you who know what that is, <laughs> little house on the prairie or something like that, and I didn't want that. So I go to the Christian bookstore and I have a problem. I can't be seen in there. I'm not going to be seen in Lifeway. Are you kidding me? My friends, or someone saw me, they'd be like, demon, what are you doing in the Christian bookstore? Ooh, you. <laughs> so I put on a hat and sunglasses. I disguised myself. Even though it's not sunny out, I walk in in a hat and sunglasses. I buy the Bible. I'm sweating bullets. I grab the first Bible I could get, and I run out of there. Then I get in my car, and I'm like, wait a minute. I have a problem. Because a Bible looks like a Bible. People aren't reading the Bible. How could I be seen opening the Bible and reading it to see what it said? I wasn't going to be seen reading the Bible of all the books. they think I was a religious fanatic or someone who's gone off the deep end or something like that or someone who has problems and is looking for a crutch, all the things that are talked about. Huh, so I had to go back in a second time. <laughs> now, by this time, the man working in the store is laughing. Here comes the guy in the disguise trying to buy a Bible. What's wrong with this man? I just told him what the deal was. I got to have a Bible I can read, but I don't want anyone to know I'm reading it. He just looked at me like, yeah, whatever. So he gave me a PC version. I put it on my computer, and okay, now I'm good. Now I can read it, and no one will know what I'm doing or what I'm reading. Now, um, I started in the New Testament 
There was a time when I tried to read the Old Testament, but the whole Adam and Eve thing threw me. So I'm like, you know, I can't, I can't go there, you know, for, with my background. So I was, I'll just start in the New Testament. Now, I read through the whole thing in about two weeks. Certainly did not comprehend it all. But, you know, medical school and all that, you learn to read quickly and just kind of get through things and get the gist of it. So I was able to do that in about two weeks. Now, three things got my attention very quickly. Number one was the unique claim of Jesus. Jesus was claiming to be and portrayed as the God-man. 100% God, 100% man. It was saying that God in heaven, the second person of the Trinity, Jesus Christ left heaven, merged himself with a fully human body to become the God-man. He's still 100% God, but now he's also merged into one person as the God-man forever. And then he came down to pay the price for sin, to die for everyone's sin. Now, that's quite a claim. There is nothing in any religion even close to that claim at all. No one has come and says, I am the answer. I don't have the answer saying, it's me, I am the answer. Now, look, I wasn't trying to prove this true, but I said, gosh, that's quite a claim. i got to find out if that's true. Number two, the thing that got my attention, I said, well, how do I know that this book's accurate? I mean, okay, he's making the claim, but maybe they made it up or whatever. But I was shocked to find that the Bible is the most historically attested ancient document of all times. If you take anything in all of ancient history, Rome, Greece, anything we know about anything, and look at the evidence, the manuscript evidence for how do we know that it's true, the Bible not only is number one, but it's number one by leaps and bounds. There's nothing even close. It's crazy. And I'm like, this is weird. How could that be? There's something funny with that. Why would this book that everyone says you can't trust, that everyone says is full of errors, that everyone says man made up, be that well attested? That just struck me as odd. And then finally, I looked at the resurrection. I said, okay, look. If he was raised from the dead, then he's God. He did conquer death. It's true. But if he wasn't raised from the dead, forget about it. I could sleep in on Sunday. I don't have to wear the suit to church. I'm not wearing one now, am I? <laughs> anyway, I looked at the resurrection and realized that it all hinged upon that. What was the evidence for it? I was shocked to find that it was absolutely overwhelming, even apart from this. Because this is something that happened in time and space and history 2,000 years ago. And I reasoned if it really happened, then God would make evidence that he really did it, if he's doing something this unique, this incredible in history. And there's basically all kinds of facts, but let me give you a bunch of them. And these, none of these are contested. Number one, Jesus was a real person who was crucified and died in the year 33 A.D. Nobody can test that. That is a historical fact proven even apart from the Bible. Number two, his apostles believed that he appeared to them and rose from the dead, having every reason not to believe that. Now, that doesn't mean that he did. They just believed that he did. Now, here's what really got me. They proclaimed something that nobody, anybody in all of the ancient world believed. Let me explain that. The Jews believed there was a resurrection of the dead, but only at the end of the age. The entire rest of the world, every other person who had a religious belief back then, they believed in afterlife, they believed in, in life after death and going to these places, but none of them believed in a physical, bodily resurrection. So if you're going to make it up, why would you pick something that absolutely nobody believes? You wouldn't. You wouldn't do that. You would, pick some, you would say that Jesus ascended to heaven and, and into the next realm, and if you believe in him, he could take you there. And then people are like, oh, yeah, I, I, can, I can believe that. You wouldn't say he ate and drank and was, could, you could touch him because everyone's going to think that you're crazy. Then you have the apostle Paul. He's killing Jews. I mean, killing Christians. He's a Jewish man killing Christians, persecuting the church, has everything to lose, nothing to gain. What could make that man turn around and do a 180 and say, no, no, the answer is Jesus? He was killing people for proclaiming it, and then he goes and proclaims it himself. But I realized that if he saw Jesus like the Bible said it was, it would make perfect sense, wouldn't it? Because he saw him. 
And then there's James, his brother. I mean, who's going to believe that their brother or sister is God? Really? You're not going to believe that. But yet he, they did. Then there's the empty tomb. You've got to explain that. You have to explain Jews switching their day of worship from Saturday to Sunday. What could make them do that? Something happened. You've got to explain Jews believing in only one God, suddenly saying, no, no, now God is a trinity. He's still one, but there's three persons in that Godhead. Where did that come from? All these facts have to be explained. And basically, at the end of the day, there was no other answer. There wasn't. There was no other explanation except that he raised from the dead. So I said, okay, I believe it. I'm going to do the church thing. I'll go to church. I'll believe. I'll dress up. I'll listen to the man speak. I'll go to the cookouts and all that. I like to eat anyway. That's why I'm going to be a Baptist. <laughs> and God will see me that, okay, this man believes. He's going to put his mark on me, tag me, and then when I die, I'll go to heaven. Now, that would have been a great deal, right? Because one of my things would have been answered. No hope. Now I've got hope. Jesus conquered death. He's raised from the dead. I'm not going to die. I'm going to go to heaven. Eternal life, blah, blah, blah. This is good. And that's all I thought that there was. An intellectual belief in my mind. And then God would take care of everything in the end. And in between, you know, I try and be good and that kind of thing. Well, about a week later, I'm still reading in stuff. I had a what I call meltdown in my room where I cried out to God and I, I kind of was convicted of all the sins and problems in my life and I asked him to change me and all this stuff. And it went on for a long time. Now, I was, I was alone and it was late at night. I used to stay up late. And I went to bed and I slept like a baby. And, uh, you know, I really never had peace before, so that night I had a lot of peace. But I thought, you know, you were... I woke up the next morning, you, were, you know, you got religious and sappy and you kind of got everything out of your, your system that had been built up inside, and of course you feel better. But no, no, I was radically different even from the very beginning. I had peace when I never had peace. I had patience when I didn't have patience. If I would pull up to a stoplight and there's a car next to me, for me, that's a race. <laughs> Could be a 70-year-old lady sitting next to me, and I'm, I'm getting ready to, to, to beat her off the line. I had love for people I didn't like. Oh, yeah, listen to this. I went to work. There were people I did not like. I didn't tell them I didn't like them, but inside I'm like, I don't like you. <laughs> Being honest, you know you felt that before. But when you go into work and then you feel a love for those people that you don't like anymore and you don't know where it's coming from, that's weird. <laughs> what is going on? I didn't curse anymore. I used profanity all the time. I learned it at a Christian camp, but that's another story. <laughs> Came home from camp, and I told my dad to pass the blanking peas and got in trouble and chased me upstairs. But anyway, I learned these things. They were, everyone talked like that where I grew up. I, I know it's bad, but that's the way it was. Instantly gone. I banged my, my toe that morning, didn't have any expletives at all. Now, look, as a doctor, I knew that something radically had happened to me. These are biochemically, neurochemically mediated events. You just don't have a change in who you are. Something was different at the molecular level. So I looked for, as a logical thing, a drug effect, something pharmacologic to explain it. I checked my medicine cabinet, and I said, well, maybe my antihistamine, which was a prescription at that time, got switched out for Valium. <laughs> because Valium makes you feel peaceful. And because there had to be some explanation. It isn't just going to happen. Because this was going on. It wasn't going away. This is like one week in, and it wasn't. So it's Christmas time, and I said, okay, I'm putting this to the test. I'm going to Walmart at Christmas time. <laughs> oh, yeah. I'm going to stand in the longest line that I can find where, you know, the, the person can't get rung up and they can't find their code, and I'm going to see if I don't care. Because I would never, I would put my stuff away and be out of there, mad, upset, frustrated, cursing, of course, along the way out. I didn't care. It didn't bother me at all. I'm laughing in the line. Everyone's mad at me. <laughs> <laughs> so I think at this time, the Lord decided, okay, we're going to let this guy in on what's really going on. They had their fun with me. And I got back into the scriptures, and I realized that Christianity isn't, a religion, but a reality. 
It's not something that you believe, but something and someone that you become. In other words, when I cried out that night to God and, and accepted Jesus and asked him to change me, something happened to the actual physical, spiritual existence of my body. The most dramatic of those things was that the Holy Spirit, God himself, indwelt me. The Bible's very clear. When you become a Christian, God now lives within you. And you go from being spiritually dead to spiritually alive. And the reason I was empty and all those things weren't fulfilling was because I wasn't created for them to fulfill me. I was created for God to do it. But I was brought up in a society that taught me it was things, people, achievements that would do it. I wasn't missing something. I was missing someone. I realized very quickly, wow, he heard what I said. Think about that. There's six billion people on the planet. How did God know what I said and that I meant it? How did he hear one person out of six billion? But even much more profound, how did he know I really meant what I said? How did he know that in here I was serious? That means he's really God. <laughs> oh, yeah. He knows the intent of the heart. I was just shocked that I grew up in a world where it says he isn't knowable, and now I'm finding out he is absolutely, infinitely personal. Crazy. I realized heaven was real. Hallelujah. I'm going there. I realized hell was real. I'm glad I'm not going there anymore. That was a very humbling fact to realize that the family that I had was headed for destruction, and I'll explain that. Now, I said, gosh, something is really wrong because I grew up in a world that didn't teach this truth at all. I decided I'm going to live for a week in carry and check everything out, see if I see any evidence of it, especially at Christmas time. I didn't find any. I found Santa Claus and reindeers and all this stuff, but nothing about Jesus at all, anywhere. Told my wife Ruth that night. She was excited but skeptical, rightfully so. She had become a believer at that time, but that's another story. And then I told my church friends who should know what I was talking about, figuring they'll say, okay, hallelujah, we've been praying for you, blah, blah, blah. But they didn't know. They didn't understand. They were sweating. They were nervous. They were anxious. They wanted to get away from me. They did not know what I was talking about, the very basic essence of the Christian faith. Called the pastor. I said, Pastor Rod, I think I'm going crazy. I've gone from no God to God living within me. He's unknowable. Now he knows everything about me. And I'm telling church people, and they don't understand, how can this be? And he explained how pastors don't believe. Many churches are about being good, but they don't even teach the basics of the Bible. That it's churchianity, not Christianity. Wow, I was shocked. So I began this relationship thing with the Lord. You know, Jesus has said, if you have my commandments and keep them, that defines love. And if you love me, I will manifest myself to you. It's in John 14. Well, that's interesting. What do you mean manifest myself? Well, I realized that, gosh, if I'm going to do that, I've got to know what's in here in order to obey. So I started reading the Bible all the time, and I realized that that was God's words talking to me. When I pray, that's my words talking to him. There's other ways that he'll speak to me, but that was the main one. I've got plenty of things to learn. And I began to grow and change, and the Lord began to answer prayers when I would ask him, and I learned to ask him about everything. I found that, sure enough, he's interested in everything. Crazy. Absolutely unbelievable. So now all my questions were answered. No peace. The emptiness, gone. Why? Because I, didn't, I was spiritually dead. I was separated from God. And when I became a Christian, now I'm joined to him. I got peace with God by Jesus on the cross. And then God gives me the peace of God after that. Crazy. So much wasted time. No power to change? Well, I was already different, far from perfect, but Jesus said, you're born again. You're a new creation in Christ. Romans 6 talks about that the old man is dead, crucified with Christ. You can now walk in the newness of life. When you give your life to the Lord, the old person dies, and you have a new person to begin. That person has to grow. That person has to still avoid sin. You're going to sin but you have power over sin to change that you didn't have before. Hallelujah. I was able to stop doing things I never could stop before. 
Not by me, but the power of God. And lastly, no hope. Wow, now the hope's living within me. The hope of heaven isn't that when you die, then you go to heaven. The hope is while you're still alive, still have that family, that you know where you're going because the power of the life of it is living within you. And you can only understand and experience that if you have it. And that's what sets you free from the fear of death. That's what, when you realize, hey, this world is messed up. God never created it this way, and he's not going to keep it this way. Now, in the last 15 minutes, God is very personal, and he really wanted me to emphasize this to the group, and it's all about relationship, not religion. It's easy to get caught up in Christian things and miss the Lord himself. Those Christian things are important, but you can be deceived by Christian things. Now, so let's go back to this story of the Bible. So a man came in my office about five years ago, and he says, I know you collect rare Bibles. I bought this about 30 years ago, and um, it's been in a shoebox. I paid about $20 for it. I don't use it. It's yours. And I said, wow, thanks. So I go in after work, and I open it up, and I read the title page, and I had known a little bit about it. Holy Bible, Old and New Testament, the common version with amendments of the language by Noah Webster, New Haven, Connecticut, 1833. You know who Noah Webster is? Webster's Dictionary? Well, the Noah Webster Bible is exceedingly rare. It is so rare you can't buy one even if you want one. Market price, $15,000, easy, depending upon the condition. This is an absolutely mint, flawless condition. No missing pages, nothing. Now look, <laughs> you want to know that God's real? You don't do something that he's telling you to do. I had a problem, didn't I? Does anyone know what it is? $15,000 Bible, guy gave it to me. It's mine. I'm not telling him, Lord, he gave it to me. It's my Bible. I'm not telling him. If I tell him, he'll take it back. For three days, I wrestled with this. I didn't want to give it back. But I knew I had to tell the man he gave me something far more valuable than he realized. That was the right thing to do. And God was all over me about it. I couldn't sleep. It was miserable. All right, I'll tell him. So I call the man up, and I say, you know, Bible's worth a lot of money. It's worth about $1,000. Uh, <laughs> do you want it back? He said, what? I said, oh, it's worth a lot of money. He says, well, how much? I said, a lot. He says, do you know how much? I'm like, yeah, kind of. <laughs> All right, it's 15000 And he said, no, don't worry about it. He's a very wealthy man. He says, you take good care of it. It was meant for you anyway. Now, here's the point of this story. Now, look. Here I am, 16, no clue of who God is, living in rampant sin, for sure. And God is buying me a present that he's going to give to me 30 years later. Think about that. That's crazy. That isn't anything of any significance. That's just a gift, a touch to show how detailed, how interested he is in me. Now, listen, there's no favorites. There's, everyone's on an equal playing field. And so if God is going to do that for me, he's that interested in you. We're asking him to do things in our lives, importance and questions. If he's going to do that, wow. Make sure you are experiencing the personal relationship of the Lord, or you are missing the very reason and essence that you were created for. And if you're stuck like me, chasing things or achievements or whatever, and you're empty and you're not sure what it is, and you've tried this and you've tried that, that's what it is. Now look, in the last few remaining minutes, I want to explain this whole gospel thing, being saved, so people understand. Okay, look, man has two problems. Number one, we're sinful. That's obvious. I didn't have a problem realizing that I was sinful. I'd done lots of bad things. And that sin separated me from God. So I need forgiveness 
and a perfect standing if I'm going to be with God who's perfect. And I also need to be reconnected to God because I've been separated from him. And it was that separation, that sin, that caused death to come into the world. I never heard an explanation for why people die. But now it made sense. Because you have people dying and people acting like they clearly shouldn't be and they know it, all kinds of evil in the world. Now it makes sense. The death comes from sin. We're not highly evolved, we're highly devolved. It's the exact opposite. No, that's exactly why being nice, going to church, volunteering, religion, sacraments, baptism, any other thing can't save you because these external acts don't change the nature of your existence like you need it changed. A good analogy is God is a supercomputer who is perfect, and the supercomputer is not going to allow a virus to enter its system. And so he cuts the cord. The PC is cut off. The personal computer is cut off from the big mainframe because it's not going to allow the virus in there. It can't. So now the PC has a virus, there's something wrong with it, and it's disconnected from the mainframe computer. But if you can remove the virus, then you can reconnect the cord, can't you? And that's exactly what Jesus did. You see, by being the God-man, coming 2,000 years ago, God merged with man. As a man, he was able to die. God can't die. But he had to be God so that that death could be infinitely applied to every person past, present, and future. And he had to be God so that when he lives the perfect life as a man, then he can give you that perfect account to your account because you can't go to heaven, you can't be with God who is absolutely perfect in the absence of sin unless you have a sinless, perfect standing, which is impossible. So only God could do it himself, but he had to become a man to do it. That's why there's only one way. There can't be another way. The only way is for God himself to come, be a man, live the perfect life, and then die for us. And the incredible thing is, is that it says that the death on the cross is personal. When Jesus was up there doing that, he didn't do it on behalf of all humanity, for everyone. He did it in everyone's individual place. That means he's thinking of you and thinking of me while he is up there. And so when you give your life to the Lord, two things happen to you. You get reconnected to God. The Holy Spirit comes into you. Now, for everyone, it's not as dramatic and as noticeable as mine, but if you start reading and praying and talking to the Lord, it will be over time. The Bible says he wants you to know that you have eternal life in 1 John. And you're forgiven and you get a perfect sinless standing with God. The slate is erased and destroyed. It's a big difference between just forgiving and then forgetting. God says he forgets the sins. Wow. So he still is the God-man. He's still there 2,000 years later. And what he did for me five years ago, or I mean 15 years ago, he is wanting to do for you today if you don't know him. Now, be very careful. If you're a church person, Jesus warns that in the last days, in the very end, people will say to him, Lord, Lord, I want to enter the kingdom of heaven. But Jesus will say, no, only he who does the will of my Father can enter heaven. Many people say, Lord, Lord, I did this and that in your name. I went to church. I, I gave. I went to Bible study, blah, blah, blah. And you'll say, no, depart from me. I never knew you. That word no in the Greek is very specific. It means an interactive personal relationship. See, people, lots of people, Jesus is warning, these are people who think they're believers of the Lord, and they're not. They're calling him Lord, but they're looking to their Christian actions as evidence of their Christianity instead of their relationship. Now, if you have kids, do you want them to show up at your house once a week, parade around your house in nice clothes, listen to a talk about you, or would you rather them all week long live with you, talk with you, eat with you, depend upon you, and thank you for being their parents? What do you think God wants? But we have turned it into that in some instances. Now, don't get me wrong. When you are a believer, church is very important. We're here. It's integral. But it's easy to get trapped in that 
religion of Christianity instead of the personal relationship. Be very careful. To the skeptic, you have heard the truth. You've heard the evidence for the truth, that it is overwhelming. You have heard that the evidence will be given to you if you take it. That's right. If you give your life to the Lord today, God will prove by changing you personally. You will know it's true. You will become spiritually alive. And that's just the beginning. The Christian life is awesome. It's exciting. It's an interactive relationship with God. The Bible says, behold, now is the accepted time. Now is the day of salvation. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. God did not send his son into the world to condemn it, but that through him everyone could be saved. This price that he paid is unthinkable. We can't imagine what he went through. That means he really, really wants us. You ever really wanted something so bad and you save for it or you can't wait to get it? Magnify that by a thousand times and that's God for you because the person that you are, he made you, he custom designed you down to the little detail. He knows every single thing about you. He wants to do something to the very nature of your existence today. Can you imagine dying and realize you missed it? Can you imagine dying and realizing that you were in church and going through the motions and you never had it and God saying that to you? The Lord's weeping when he says this, guys. He's not like, oh, depart from me. Can you imagine having sat here today and missed it and hardened your heart and that was your last chance? You don't know what's going to happen to you. You could die today on the way home in a car accident. Anything can happen. Do not leave here. If you're not sure, then make sure. And if you're a believer and you're a Christian and you've drifted away from the Lord and you're not in the Word, then recommit to the Lord. Get back in the Word. Not because you're supposed to or that's what you're supposed to do as a Christian. Well, get that out of your head because that's the very reason you're made. You're missing the reason you exist. It's not I, I'm supposed to do these Christian things. It's I get to. I have an opportunity to. It's the opposite. Once you get that, you're going to wake up and spend time with the Lord. You're going to read the Word. You're going to talk to the Lord about everything. Because when you realize that he's willing to do something like this, then he's interested in every single detail of your life. And if you pray and ask, I'm not saying he'll fix everything, but it doesn't hurt to ask. He's interested in the details. All right, I want everyone to close their eyes, bow your heads. I'm going to give you an opportunity right now. I'm not going to embarrass you. You don't have to come down front. I'm not even going to make you raise your hand. You pray this prayer to God. Lord, I want to be saved. I want to be a Christian. I realize you died for me on the cross, that you made me. I realize why I'm empty, and I want you now. Come into my life. Make me the person you want me to be. Forgive me my sins. I believe in what you did. Pray that to him. God's tugging on your heart very hard right now if you don't know him or if you've been deceived and I do not want you to leave and he does not want you to leave here. So please, just do business with the Lord. It's between you and him. You can tell other people about it later. Keep it personal. Whatever you want to do, it doesn't matter. And if you're a believer, pray, Lord, I need to get back. I'm, I'm not in the relationship. I'm... I'm I'm stuck in church things, or I'm not, I'm not reading my Bible. I'm not praying to you. I'm not talking to you. I want to get that right. Forgive me, and Lord, I'm going to come back. I'm, I want to do better. Pray that prayer to God. Lord, I thank you for the opportunity to speak on your behalf. Lord, you know who is yours in here, and you know who has talked with you. And we pray you richly bless them and they grow you and they know what you've done for them and they grow in their relationship with you from this day forward. In Jesus' name, amen.